Hello. Nice to see you all. Thank you for coming. My name is Chris McMahon. We're going to talk about browser testing in Ruby, but uh, let me just play my ukulele for a second because it's, it's Salesforce, and uh, I love this little song about Ruby. Ruby is her name. She don't love me, but I love her just the same. Ruby, Ruby, I'm going to want you. Like a ghost, I'm going to haunt you. Ruby, Ruby, when will you be mine? I got a gal and Ruby is her name. She don't love me, but I love her just the same. Ruby, Ruby, I'ma want you. Like a ghost, I'm gonna haunt you. And I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I still <laughs> Thank you very much. A little silliness on Friday. Um, I have one other slide. I don't like PowerPoint. Um, this is my anti-safe harbor. Everything you're going to see today is open source software. It's in use today. Furthermore, it's all open source under the BSD license. So not only the test code, but the target code being tested. You can take that code. You can fork it. You can use it internally. Um, you can put your logo on it, and you can sell it if you want. That BSD license allows you to do all of that. Let me uh, pull this up. Also, before I start, Salesforce.org needs developers. If you are an Apex programmer, Force.com developer, please, bit.ly, sfdo-dev. Uh, it's an awesome team, and you make the world a better place. So let's talk about browser tests. And I'm going to show you the final project first. We're going to kick off. These are all my browser test builds that run for uh, nonprofits, the sex pack, the higher ed data architecture, and campaign tools. These are all products and projects of the salesforce.org. And uh, you can see my test for Internet Explorer failed the other day, so just because it's Internet Explorer. Well, this may not work. Come on. Here we go. My internet suddenly went very bad. So Jenkins, of course, is a, center, is a uh, continuous integration server. And what's happening now, I'm starting this build up. And on my Jenkins server, Jenkins' job is pulling up Ruby, it's checking that I make sure all the libraries I have are ready. And it's calling out to Sauce Labs. Everybody heard of Sauce Labs? Yeah, OK. They, uh, over at Sauce Labs, I'm telling Sauce Labs to spin me up a virtual machine and give it the operating system that I tell it to, and I give it the version of the browser that I tell it to. In this case, it's going to be Chrome on Windows 10, I believe. So uh, let's take a look. You can see, here's my console output, and I'm going to just show you. See, my first test is green. This is really good. I log in. And we can actually go over in Sauce Labs, and we can watch these tests run in real time. So, uh, you know, assuming the internet works. Um, Sauce Labs is really fine for uh, open source support. They've always been had a great, great support for open source. So I want to talk about why Ruby. If you're going to do browser testing, cross-browser functional testing at the UI, why Ruby? And before I joined Salesforce.org, um, I spent a little over three years at Wikipedia. And I built the browser testing operation at Wikipedia. And before I did that, I did a whole lot of research on the different languages. And for a long time, it boiled down to you had a choice of Java or C Sharp, fully supported Selenium bindings, Java or C Sharp, Python or Ruby. And recently, they've added JavaScript. And this is just in the past few months, JavaScript in the form of Node.js. But I looked at the tools, and the tools for testing built into the Ruby language are far superior to any other language. And we're going to explore some of the, those tools and some of the ways that you can utilize what's built into the Ruby ecosystem for browser testing. Um, this is the Selenium HQ page, in case you ever need it. First thing I want to talk about is Cucumber. Any, you know the, the term Cucumber? Yeah? Cucumber is a way, basically it's a way to specify what your test is doing in plain English. 
Um, and there's two things about cucumber I want to point out. I'm going to have an example, but first thing I want to say is that there's a book about cucumber. You don't have to write cucumber from scratch. There's a whole book. You can learn it. Um, and I'm going to point out, here's a very, very simple cucumber test. And in my cucumber test, cucumber has three things. It has a given part, a when part, and a then part. And it turns out this lends itself to browser testing really well. Your given statement is your preconditions. It's your starting point. It's everything that has to be in place in order for this test to make sense. And your when step are verbs. They're actions. And this is particularly great for browser testing because a UI test is the only kind of test, unlike a unit test, unlike an API test, the a UI test is the only kind of test that initiates multiple states in your application. So your when step is always a verb. Your then step is your assertion. It's you assert something about the state of your user interface at the end of all these verbs that tells you that, yes, your feature is, in fact, functioning the way you intend. So in this case, my, my preconditions are I navigate to the page, and my begin button is disabled. And this is what I love about Cucumber. The account field is visible. I check all the boxes. It doesn't matter if there's eight boxes. It doesn't matter if there's 15 boxes. We don't care about the implementation of this step. We just want to know what the test is doing. And so then my disabled begin button becomes not disabled. And that's th what this test is all about. And what I love about Cucumber, again, is uh, I write big browser test frameworks that last a long time. And so I write this test, and six months later, or a year later, or two years later, when this test fails, I know what it was doing. I don't have to look at this crazy code. I know what this thing is doing in plain English. So we can take Cucumber, and we can make it quite a bit more complex. This is probably the most complex user interface in the nonprofit success pack. And we can do some manage households and some basic checks. We're going to add members, delete members, change a household address, copy household addresses, cancel buttons, modals, click in all the check boxes. Has anyone tried to automate lightning design system things? Fun stuff, huh? Check boxes are my nemesis. So let's take a look at our build back. See our build. Our build's still green. I'll note, too, this is another lovely thing about the tools in Ruby, is that the output is standardized, and Jenkins knows how to interpret this. It gives me green when I pass. It gives me red when I fail. It's really nice. And I'm kind of hoping my build fails here in the talk, because then I can show you a, a nice failure. Um, and I'm briefly going to talk about RSpec. So it, uh, from time to time, you need to assert something kind of complex, uh, this and this, or it has to match your particular regular expression, or all sorts of things. RSpec is an incredibly powerful assertion library. And again, it's standard in the Ruby programming language. Um, this book is out of date, but just take my word for it. It's extremely well documented. So let me see. We've talked about with Cucumber and with RSpec, you can test anything. So what does this have to do with browsers, right? So here's where we talk about browsers. So back before Selenium ever existed, there was a browser testing tool in the Ruby language called Web Application Testing in Ruby. And as a matter of fact, I was user number one for water. I was the first point one to ever point water to a production environment. I've been doing this for a really long time. Um, and the uh, design philosophy of Selenium version 1 and Water were very similar. They wanted to give the, the user a rich API. It would be all things to all users, so this really huge set of API methods that you could call. In Selenium version 2, that changed. You all may know about WebDriver. Selenium WebDriver, the design philosophy was to publish the bare minimum set of automatable things that any browser can do. And this is why WebDriver is a, web, is a worldwide web standard today. It is a, and every browser maker supports it. Uh, Safari most recently, Chrome, Internet Explorer, Opera, Firefox, all support WebDriver as a web standard, um, which is brilliant. But 
the intent was you would take these basic building blocks and you'd build up your own domain-specific language, your own DSL to test your own application. But you know, a lot of us old guys, we missed that powerful API. For, so not too long after WebDriver came out, a guy named Yari Bakken took the water web driver and he re-implemented it as a wrapper around Selenium web driver. And he called it water web driver, just like here. And just a, a cursory look over the API calls, you can find all sorts of things that are just simply not in Selenium. And these are all available to water. And of course, water is only available in Ruby. What's brilliant about what Yari did is that uh, water web drivers actually automatically built according to standards. On one side, he's got an automated hook into the HTML5 standard. On the other side, he's got an automated hook into the WebDriver standard. So these are automatically march along in real time. Um, again, it's a brilliant implementation. Ayari gave up maintaining it, but it's been taken over by a guy named Titus Fortner, who is uh, the maintainer of the Ruby bindings as well. So this is super powerful, rich API that does so much more than the raw Selenium API, it's only available in Ruby. I'm going to talk about another bit. Um, about a little over five years ago, um, the browser testing community agreed on a design pattern that the, is the proper way to implement automated browser testing. It's called the page object design pattern. Um, and the basic idea is very simple, is that you, uh, you you only ever locate any element on any page one time. And then you put an abstract hook to that. So every step that uses that locator uses the abstraction and not the element itself. And this makes maintenance very easy. And there's also people are taking the page object design pattern and doing some other things with it. Like Anthony Marcano has a, has a kind of sophisticated take on this that people are starting to pay attention to. But another thing about Ruby that we like very much is that no other language has an institutional implementation of the page object design pattern. And this gem, this is a Ruby gem. You can download it. It was written by a guy named Jeff Morgan, named Cheesy. He was the founder of uh, the Lean Dog, con Agile Consulting Company, if, you, uh, if you've ever heard of Lean Dog. And again, page object is a really rather brilliantly implemented implementation. And, it's, and it saves you a whole lot of time. I'm going to stop here, actually. Are there any questions at this point? Is, so, so far, I've talked about you can use Cucumber, and you can R, use RSpec to test anything you want. And you can use Water Web Driver, which gives you the super powerful beyond Selenium set of APIs to manipulate your browser tests. We have Page Object, which is an individual, which is a community supported implementation of a generally accepted design pattern. None of these tools exist in any language other than Ruby. So I'm about to talk about the Salesforce part. Any questions so far, though? Doesn't look like it. So what does this have to do with Salesforce, right? This is what you want to know. So if you recall, uh, yeah, and, and just checking in on the build. Build looks good. That's fine. Um, if you recall, originally I pointed out, I've got a browser test repo for the nonprofit success pack. I've got a browser test repo for campaign tools. I've got a browser test repo for the higher education data architecture. I've got another browser test repo coming up for the student advisor link. I've got a large number of browser repos. And you remember the cucumber, my given step. I have to have these preconditions in order for my test to make sense. Pretty much every test I run, I have to set up test data. And I have to tear that test data down at the end of the test. So I do that with the Salesforce API. I need contacts. I need accounts. I need opportunities. I need affiliations. I need relationships. I need to change settings values. I need to do all of these things. And it's incredibly tedious and incredibly expensive to do this in the user interface. So I'm using the Salesforce API. And it quickly became apparent to me that all of my repos share API code. 
So I set out to make a Ruby gem so that all of my repos, repos could just download the Ruby gem. And incidentally, this gives all of you an open source way to access the Salesforce API in a really powerful way. Because what we also quickly discovered was that my developers work in their development organizations and they have unmanaged code. But then we need to package it up and we need to do push upgrades so we have managed code. And, the, and it quickly became apparent that I need to handle namespaces. Nonprofit Starter Pack itself has six entirely different namespaces because of historical reasons. Furthermore, I have custom fields on Salesforce objects that have namespaces or don't. And I have custom fields on custom objects that have namespaces or don't and may even have different namespaces than the custom object that they're put on. So I was quickly out of my head or out of my uh, comfort zone, and, and I'm not the best programmer in the world. So I looked around for some help, and I'll point him out there at the end of the row. Kevin Poorman, ladies and gentlemen, gave me an enormous amount of help and continues to work with me. He's a brilliant programmer. He's an architect for Salesforce Mobile. Uh, stuff. He's a former MVP, multiple winners, and he's a brilliant Ruby programmer, and we've been working on this. And what this does, in a, in a nutshell, is it takes advantage of Ruby's metaprogramming abilities. And so at runtime, when I use the APIs to create test data, to tear down test data, at runtime, we generate on the fly a method that is appropriate for whatever namespace our particular objects may have. This is super powerful. This is incredibly powerful. And even if you're not using browser test automation, if you're just doing something with Salesforce and Ruby, quick one-off scripts, if you've got namespaces to deal with, you may want to look in to SFDO API. Um, uh, it's under development. It's rapidly under development as we speak. We've got the, all of our delete methods are namespace agnostic. Our create method is namespace agnostic as of, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, update is coming. We're not there yet. And we've still got to handle the namespace mismatch on fields versus objects. And that, let me take a quick look. I had planned to talk for about 20 minutes, given time for testing, I mean for questions. But let me just recap. You have a choice if you're going to do browser testing. You have a choice of languages. And fully supported languages, as I said, they're Java and C Sharp, which I don't like, you may, but there's reasons to use them. Python, Ruby, and just very recently, JavaScript in the form of Node.js. And I submit to you from many years of experience that the testing tools available in Ruby are superior to any other language. So since most of you will be programming in Apex, maybe a little JavaScript, it's worth considering Ruby. You have Cucumber for acceptance test-driven development, for regression testing, the English language implementation. You can collaborate with your project managers and your product managers on what a test should do. This is a brilliant way to use Cucumber. We have RSpec, super powerful assertion library to, to uh, match and assert anything you need to assert about your feature being tested. For browsers, we have Water Web Driver, web application testing in Ruby, a super powerful wrapper for Selenium Web Driver, always modern, always up to date automatically. Titus has some really cool plans for water, too. There's more coming from water. You have the page object Ruby gem. Out of the box implementation of a page object design pattern so you don't have to build it yourself. That's another thing I should mention about Titus. He's an ambitious young man. Titus wants to actually implement a uh, page object Ruby gem that's community supported and not just Jeff Morgan supported. So that may be in our future, too. So for browsers themselves, we have water web driver. We have page object. And finally, for Salesforce.org, we have this incredibly powerful namespace agnostic Ruby gem that will allow you to set up and tear down data in unmanaged code, managed code, any combination, any number of namespaces. 
And that is all I have for you. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you didn't mind the ukulele too much. I had a blast. Um, all of this, as I say, is open source. It's all available on the web. You can Google it. It's around. And um, I'd be pleased to take any questions. Yeah, can you use Factory Girl to generate data? Sure, you can use anything you want to generate data. Um, and you can put this up in the form of a file or a, a stream. I mean, whatever you want to do is fine. Um, again, if you, uh, the, the power of the API wrapper is that you can do it with reg without regard to namespace. If you form your call to SFDO properly, you never have to worry about a namespace. So you just give it the object handle or the field handle, and at runtime, under the covers, we're going to query the existing state of the org that you're working in and find out what namespace may be attached to that handle that you sent to the, to the API wrapper. It's very slick. And, and again, Kevin is, is brilliant. And I, I couldn't have done it without his help. Anyone else? Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's been very much my pleasure. And if you think of any questions later, you can find me on Org62. You can find me on Twitter. I'm Chris McMahon. I'm around. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>